Hey, I'm glad you're here today. Um, you know, when I was growing up, um, I had this great, these great aspirations of being this world-class athlete. Well, the problem was that I wasn't a world-class athlete. And uh, as I was growing up wanting to be that, is that I soon found out that I'm not going to be able to accomplish that feat. Well, as I was growing up, I was, as uh, my mom and dad decided for me, it was amazing how that worked in my house. I really never got a say so in a lot of things. They decided for me that my mom decided that you need to take piano lessons. Well, I didn't want to take piano lessons because that means I had to work at it. And still to this day, the one thing I do regret is that I quit taking piano at a very early age. But then my mom and dad also decided that he needs to be in the elementary band. Well, the problem with that was, was that if you're in the elementary band, then you are going to miss out on the afternoon recess, which I wanted no part of. And so when I was doing the elementary band, I was a trombone player. Now understand in the band is that you are seated by your talent. So the first chair was the best. Well, we had three trombones and so I was the third seat, okay? And so even in piano, when we did recitals, they always saved the best person for last. I was always the first person to perform. It never did fail. And I think a lot of times is that that's sort of the way that we are with our relationship with God is that we sort of feel like, you know what, we're this less than average kind of person and therefore there's no way God's gonna be able to use me as a leader because I might be on the team, but I feel like I spend most of my time on the sideline and I really don't, I'm really not that kind of person that's really gonna lead out. And in this series that we started last week, last weekend, Senseless Leading Beyond Logic. We, uh, we interviewed a girl by the name of Ginger Reynolds, if you weren't here. I'd really encourage you to go back and watch that online. And even with all that, we, introduced, we were introduced to a character in the Old Testament by the name of David, King David. Now at this point, uh, David was not the king of Israel, is that David was just a shepherd boy. And matter of fact is that they had appointed and anointed him to be king, although he wasn't king yet because King Saul was a king and they had to wait for King Saul to die off before David took the reins as a leader in the nation of Israel. Now, you think about this is that here's a guy that, that they, are, they are wanting to be the king of a nation. And so now what happens is, is that King Saul has died and now David is leading the nation and we're gonna pick up, if you brought a copy of God's word, we're gonna pick up in 1 Chronicles chapter 11. And in this story, you're gonna see that David is leading the armies of Israel against the Philistines. And the scripture says is that they are in a stronghold against this, against this, Philistine, uh, this, Philist, this Philistine army. And so here David is, and I mean, it, the battle is intense. The Philistines were all around them. And David has 30 men in his life that are his generals. These 30 men are the ones who are overseeing probably thousands of, of army people in the, the Israelite army. And so we pick up in 1 Chronicles chapter 11 and sort of in the heat of the battle. And so everything that we're gonna be reading in uh, this week, next week, and the next week will all come from 1 Chronicles 11 verses 15 through 19. So we're gonna read from there. So would you stand with me as we read in reverence to the word of God? It says, three of the 30 chiefs came down to David to the rock at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for a water and said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David but he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out to the Lord. God forbid that I should do this, he said. Should I drink the blood of these men who went at the risk of their lives? Because they risked their lives to bring it back, David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. Now, I wanna tell you that a lot of times when I speak, and I know this, a lot of times I'll hit one demographic and I won't hit the other. 
It's, I want you to know that it doesn't matter what you do for a living. It doesn't matter if you're in the workplace, if you're a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad, if you're a student and you're in school, whatever the case may be, I want you to know that these leadership principles are going to work for every individual here. It will work in your business place. It'll work in your individual lives. It will also work in your own personal life. So I pray that God will really speak to you today about you going to a next level to become even a greater leader than God has you right now. So pray with me, would you? God, thanks for today. Thanks for your word that we were able to draw leadership principles from. And God, I pray that through just the struggles that people have today and the struggles they bring in here today, and God, I know with the amount of people that are here, there are many people that have those struggles today. And I pray, God, that even in the struggles that people would understand, that we would all understand how you want us to lead even through the struggles. So, God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Have a seat. Thanks for standing. So we're talking about three principles that we need to apply. So here's the first principle to apply is to prepare the heart. Prepare the heart. Now see, what we attempt to do, especially for us men, is that we begin to compartmentalize everything in our life so that one chamber of our heart is our social life, one chamber of our life is our, is our, uh, is our family life, one chamber of our life is our work life, and then one chamber of our life is our spiritual life. And yet what God does is that God takes the heart and correlates everything together and says, no, the heart is one thing. And understand that as the heart is one thing, God wants us to understand that we cannot compartmentalize everything that we do in our life because that's usually what we do. We compartmentalize and we just say, God, you can have one area, but you really can't have the other area. Because see, when we begin to compartmentalize our life is that we think that God can have, will run one part of our life and yet he doesn't run another part of our life. And God takes the heart and he it is one unit and everything stems from that. It's amazing that when you talk to people and they begin to tell you any kind of problem they might be going through at the time and you ask the question, hey, sort of unpack for me what your faith looks like. What is your journey of faith? What did, what's going on there? And inevitably, somebody's gonna say, well, to be honest about it, that's really not my struggle. My faith is not my struggle. It's this that's my struggle. And understand is that your faith runs everything in your life. You can't compartmentalize this because it runs everything. It is the source of what, every, of what everything happens in, in our life. So when you look at the heart itself, you see the heart is the mental center. It considers, it reflects, it knows, it remembers, it understands. But also the heart is the emotional center. It's the seed of our anxiety, our courage, our loneliness, our fear, our despair, our joy. But also the heart is the moral center. So anything that you think about morality, whatever is right or wrong, that comes out of your heart. Now you might be here today and going, you know what, I think my heart's good, but I think I just don't think some things are wrong that other people think are wrong. Even if somebody can point to you in scripture that something is not right in your life is that we look at it and go, well, that's, that's really an okay thing for me. No, it's not because see, that's an issue, a matter of your own heart. That's the reason in Proverbs 40, uh, 4.23, it says this, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So you guard your heart because the Holy Spirit lives in our heart. So if, you don't, if we don't guard our heart, everything in our life is gonna be messed up. So here's what I want you to do for me. I want you to think for just a second, what is that one sin in your life that really keeps you from being what God wants you to be? Now, if you're here right now and you're going, I don't have that sin. Well, let me give you your sin. It's called pride, okay? That's, you can start with that one, okay? Then you go to narcissism. You can go to there as well, all right? But see, think about those sins, whatever that sin might be. Like, if you were asking me that question, I don't even have to blink. I know what my sin is. I know what that Hebrews talks about, that entangling sin. Now, I'm not gonna tell you what my sin is, so don't think I'm gonna tell you my sin on that one, all right? So, but what is your sin that you have? So anything that you struggle with, any sin that you struggle with, it is an issue of the heart. 
to whatever sin that we have. And you see, our heart is either going to seek light or it's going to seek darkness. And that's a reason that when we look at it is that, is that our, heart is, our heart is either going to serve the kingdom of light or it's going to serve the kingdom of darkness. And you might be here right now and going, well, Phil, I'm really not all that of everything God wants me to be, but I'm not on the other side. I'm not completely dark. So I'm sort of stuck in the middle here, okay? And I think that's where a lot of people live. And let me tell you what Jesus says about that heart. He says in the book of Revelation, he says, he said, I would rather you be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. The rendering of that word is to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, why would Jesus give so explicit words about that word, about I don't want you to be lukewarm? And here's why, is that when you're lukewarm, you will do more harm for the kingdom than you would if you're cold. Because see, if you're cold, everybody knows you're cold. Everybody knows you're living for darkness and, and you're really not a threat to anything. But when you are lukewarm, is that people don't know where you stand on anything because of your heart is lukewarm. Your actions produce that as well, but it starts with your heart. That's the reason you have, to, you have to prepare your heart. So ask yourself right now, okay, am I living for darkness or am I living for light? Am I living for the kingdom of darkness or am I living for the kingdom of light? You see, because you look at David. David was a guy that really, he didn't have it all together. I mean, this is a guy that he was not a good dad. He was not a good husband. He had an affair. He not only had an affair, he committed murder to cover up his sin with a lady he had the affair with. I mean, this guy was not your model citizen of integrity. And yet this is what 30 men knew about David, that through all of it, I can trust his heart. Because the scripture says about David, it's the only man that God ever said that he seeks after my heart. Now, here's the good news for us, is that even in the sin that we have, in the issues of integrity in our life, and you might be thinking here today, you know what, I can't lead because of this, some issue in your life. You know what, there are more, most of the people in the Old Testament, most of the men especially, they struggle with depression, they struggle, they struggle with anxiety, and yet their heart still sought after the heart of God. And so these 30 men in the battle with David, they know about his heart. They said, this guy was seeking after the heart of God. So what happens with us a lot of times is that we don't really want God to fix our heart. And we have all these reasons of why God can't fix our heart. For some of you today, it's an issue of anxiety. For some, it's depression. For some, it's loneliness. For some, it's fear. And for some, it's sorrow. And those are, I mean, some of those things are even are true in my family as well. And so I understand that. And so, and this could be true in, in your life as well. And, and it might be to a point to where you have to have professional help. It could be that you have to have a prescription, you have to have counseling, you have to have a psychiatrist. And I'm not against any of those things. And, and, you know, and you've heard me say it before, I'll continue to say it, is that when people walk up to you and go, oh, brother, sister, just trust God, get off your meds. Do not get off your meds, all right? For especially somebody who doesn't study medicine, don't do that, all right? For our sake, don't get off your meds, okay? So you understand that that might, be, that might be true, but see, a lot of times when we deal with that, what we do is that we step back and we go, oh my goodness, I struggle with all this, so you know what? I just don't believe that God is who he says that he is. And so we begin to struggle with this person of God and our heart moves away from what God has for us. And so therefore what we do is, is that because we struggle with these things, we go, well, you know what? God's just really outdated. I mean, I just really can't believe that God would tell me I can't do this because God knows that I love this. And if I do this, he's gonna be a real killjoy. You see what God understands about your heart is that God knows that the only way that you're gonna be able to have peace and purpose and freedom in your life is that you, got, you have to allow God to fix your heart. So remember these two things, okay? Don't forget this. Number one, you've got to be willing to give your heart away to Jesus. That's the first step. If you don't do that, you're gonna be messed up the rest of your life. We're already messed up as the way it is. But at least when you got Jesus, he can direct your heart. So number one, you gotta give your heart away to Jesus. Number two, after you do that, it's a daily thing to continue to guard your heart. So you, you, are you tracking with me? You good? 
Yeah, this means yes. We're good? Okay, all right. So the rest of it, hopefully you'll wake up. You even had an hour more sleep last night, all right? So the, when we look at this and we look at, at what the heart is about is that we've got to allow God to continue just to do things with our heart. So ask yourself, okay, in my heart right now, is my heart, is it driven for darkness or is it driven for light? Here's a second principle to apply, is to show up. You see, in the midst of fighting the Philistines, he's in a stronghold. I mean, the battle is tense. And then David is here and he is in battle. He's commanding 30 generals and then he just makes the comment. Oh, I wish I had some water from Bethlehem. You see, he, he, didn't, tell, he didn't tell three guys to do it. As a matter of fact, three guys just showed up and overheard him say it. Now, the other 27 generals, they didn't do anything wrong, but these three, they showed up. And, and matter of fact, nobody even chose them. David didn't choose them. They chose themselves. They showed up. And understand, by you being here today, by you showing up today, you've allowed God to do some things in your life, whether you know this or not, you've allowed God to do some things in your life just in leadership itself. So you see, but this is what we usually do when it comes to just showing up. Oh God, you know what? <laughs> oh man, it's just raining today and man, it's cold outside. So God, you really, I know you really don't expect me to show up for church today. I mean, God, because I mean, you obviously brought the rain, it's cold, you want me to stay in bed and God, I'll just worship you with my eyelids shut and I'm okay right here. Or the next week comes and it's sunny. Oh God, you gave me this day so I could be on the lake with my family and thank you for giving me this. Oh God, this is a great thing. Oh God, you're just so good. And God, and to be honest, God, come on now. I mean, I've been two weeks in a row. Surely I get a week off, right? I mean, that's usually what we do when it comes to showing up. And you see, what, what happens is, is that when we don't show up, even with God's people to worship corporately, is that you miss the supernatural activity of what God wants to do. And not for one minute do I think that God can't speak to you in a deer stand. Matter of fact, I'm glad for all you hunters that he made it so warm. I know that's why you're here today and not in a deer stand, all right? So I just know that, all right? But I am so glad that you're here. But I don't, God can speak to you on a deer stand. He can speak to you out, out somewhere in, in, in the woods. Now, the one place he, he ain't gonna speak to you, and I just know this, he's not gonna speak to you on the golf course. Because if you had a bad shot, you begin to cuss, God ain't, he's not speaking to you there, all right? So I understand, but, but listen, God can speak to you in your devotional time, in your house, at your home. He can speak to you in your workplace. He can speak to you in a deer stand, but I want you to know that God is not going to speak to you like he was to speak to you here because of the supernatural activity of the presence of the Holy Spirit here. And when people come together, there is just something that you can't explain that happens here. Why do you think there were so many times in scripture that they talked about going to the temple and, and rejoicing as they went to the temple because it was the activity of God that they longed for. It was the presence of God that they longed for. And just by you showing up here today, whether you know this or not, is that it's a great leadership principle in your life to where God is, wants to do something in your life that you cannot imagine. You think about when Jesus has died and he, after he is resurrected, he shows up in a room with 10 disciples. Now the reason he has 10 there, not 12, is that Judas has died and Thomas, doubting Thomas, he's not anywhere around. And so Jesus shows up and when Jesus shows up in that room is that the disciples go back and tell Thomas, Thomas, guess what? Jesus showed up. No, no he didn't, I don't believe that. I mean, that would like, be like somebody walking up to you and going, hey, guess what? So-and-so showed up at your house. No, no, they didn't. I don't believe you. Dude, I was there. I saw that individual. I know he's there. Thomas, I know. We know he was there. We saw him. Unless I can touch his scars and feel his side, I'm not going to believe you. You see, Thomas didn't get to experience Jesus personally. All Thomas got to do was hear the rumors about Jesus personally. And when we show up, when we, when we don't show up here, all we're doing is hearing the rumors about the activity of God. You're not present to, to, to be able to experience of what God's really doing. And so you understand when we talk about showing up, this same principle is not just about church, it's about work as well. 
the reason that some of you have a successful business, even though there are tough days and some of you don't even like the place that you work, is because you have consistently, faithfully just showed up day after day after day. Do you know what consistency and the power of that will do in a workplace? I can't tell you how many times that I that I hear people who own business who are hire, try to hire try to hire teenagers and they just look at me and go, they, they just don't show up. Well, they don't show up. Well, then understand that's a leadership principle in their life. But for some of you, I mean, God's using you in a great way because you are consistently, faithfully showing up in your work. It's the same principle in your devotional life. It's that if you consistently, faithfully show up, you'll be amazed at what God will do with you. When you don't, when you when you say, you know what, I'm in the Word, but I'm in the Word probably once a month, you're not showing up very cons- consistently. When you don't show up and being faithful in your family life, I mean, your family's never going to be what it needs to be until you are faithfully showing up. So you see, these guys, they showed up. So understand, ask, what we do is that when we talk about showing up, is that God's agenda for you in the workplace is not just to show up, but is to have an impact. Because if I were to ask the question, how many of you right now where you work, you hate your job? Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask the question because your boss might be sitting in here, okay? Some of you go, I've even got people raising their hands right now. That's me, all right? Understand, haven't we all been there at some point in our life? We just really don't like work. But I need you to understand this. The reason it's so important for you to faithfully show up is that God's agenda for your life is to use your heart, not being driven to darkness, but being driven to light. And when you're driven to light and you show up and you faithfully show up with your life and your faith, God's gonna impact people around you because you show up. I can still remember. Is that my man Carlton Bell over here, who owns Chick-fil-A. We've had two kids who've worked for him. The first day that Sarah Grace went to work for him, called how old was she? 14, 15, something? She had to be at work at 11. And so I told her, I said, we're leaving here, we're leaving the house, we're gonna leave the house at 1020. Dad, it don't take, it don't take 40 minutes to get Chick-fil-A. Thank you for telling me that, okay? I know that, all right? So we went, we showed up, Carlton was there, he looks at Sarah Grace, Sarah Grace walks in. He said, Sarah Grace, it's 20 minutes to 11. You don't show up. You don't, you're not supposed to show up until 11. Well, I know. And I never forget, he looked at her and said, great leadership principle. And ever since then, she's always shown up early because she wants everybody to know I'm faithful just to show up. You'd be amazed. What would God just do in our life if we just showed up in our spiritual journey? No, just show up. Let me give you the third principle. Move to the front line. You ever long for something? I mean, you really long for it? And David says, oh, I just wish I had some water from Bethlehem. I really ought to understand this principle being married 31 years is that When we were, Sharon and I were first married, we lived in several towns, is that when we were going out of town and it's breakfast time, there was a certain place that she wanted to go for breakfast. How many of you have ever eaten at a Whataburger? Raise your hand. Oh, I'm gonna tell you, man, that is Jesus speaking right there. I'm telling you, man. That's a great burger right there. And she would go, oh, oh, I, I just, can we go, can we go to Whataburger? I just want to get a taquito with cheese. That's a breakfast burrito, okay? Oh, and my mild sauce to go with it. Oh, I just love to have that. And then we're married. She called me and she'd go, oh, oh, I just wish I had a Pantora's pizza. Oh, that sounds great. I'll pick you up. We'll go. Oh, I don't really want to drive. I don't want to leave the house. Oh, is this like this passive aggressive thing going on where you tell me that you want this, but you really expect me to go get it and bring it home? Oh, would you? Oh, I would love you. Oh, uh, can we just go to Panera? Yeah, I'll come by and pick you up. Oh, I don't really want to get out of the house. 
He was picking up for me. And David comes to the point and he goes, ah, oh, I just wish I had some water. You see, Shara's asking, passively aggressive. You need to pray for her about that, okay? <laughs> Passive, passively aggressive. She's asking. David's not being a passive aggressive. David's just going, oh, I just wish I could have some water. I just wish that, I just wish I had that. I just, I just want some water. And what would we say to David? Oh, David, me too. I'd love to have some water, but David, we're fighting the Philistines. We're in a stronghold. We can't go right now. Let's wait, and I'll get you some after, we, after we've killed all of them. I'll go get you some water. You see, we do this because this is not, it's not safe to go to the front lines. Because, see, there's great fear in going to the front lines. This is one of the greatest hindrance or probably the greatest hindrance in the movement of God in the local church in America today is our safety and our security. You see, we want to play it safe. That's for, for some of you here today, that's the reason that you would never ever, I mean, you're, you're all in until God says, I want you to trust me with your money. I know some of you right now are going, oh God, here he goes again. Here he goes, he's going to preach about tithing. I am so glad that I'm not going to disappoint you today, all right? You see, God has a biblical standard. His biblical mandate to us is that I want you to take your first 10%, not the last 10. I want you to take the first 10, first fruits. I want you to give it to me through the local church because Jesus died for the local church. So therefore, I want you to give your first 10%, take your hands off of it and trust me with it. It's just a spiritual biblical principle. Just show up and do that. You see, but you don't want to do that because she... The safety and security for you is, is that no, I have my money, it's my money, it's my job. It ain't your money, it ain't even your job. It's God's job and it's God's money. Because if God could speak in one second, he can not only take your job and your money, he can take your life if he wanted to. But by his grace, he lets us live. And by his grace, he calls us, I want you to take your first 10% and I want you to give it to me. But see, some of you won't go to the front lines and it's keeping you from being a next level leader because you don't want to go to the front lines because see, it's safety, it's about safety and security. No, man, I, I got to keep my money. Do you know what I could do with that other 10%? And here's what you better understand. You do a whole lot better than trusting God with 90% that he gives back to you than 100% that you're driving yourself. Oh, it's always true about that. And so for some of you, that's, that's, why, that's why you want to be comfortable. You want to be comfortable with, with your money. God, I have to have it. That's why some of you are still struggling so much financially. It's a spiritual principle because you don't want to show up and you sure don't want to move to the front lines with that. And you see, it's not just about this, but it's about in every area in our life is that we want to choose to be comfortable with our life. You see, the church will only be as great as the individuals in it who will, who will decide, I'm not only showing up, but we're moving to the front lines. And even this morning when I'm out there in the lobby before the first service and I'm seeing people crying and crying with other people and praying with them because of the struggles they're having, even in their struggle, they didn't just show up. They have moved to the front lines. That's why God blesses the church. God will bless the church when the church will decide, no, we're not just gonna show up. We're gonna move to the front lines. We're gonna be everything that God's called us to be. And even if there's some of you who don't wanna do that, there'll be enough that will make the church, the Bridge Fellowship, a great church because you are choosing to move to the front lines. And understand when you go to your workplace and you're affecting your workplace because you move to the front lines, that comes into the church as well. And for some of you here, you're going, why is God really not doing a lot? Because you're more concerned about your career than you are God moving you to the front lines in your spiritual journey. Oh, the Bridge Fellowship, it'll be a good church. But I'll just be real honest with you. I don't live long enough to pastor a good church. I want to be a great church. I want to be the church that other people talk about. And not because of me and not because of our worship pastor, as cute as he might be, okay? Not because of that joker, but because of individuals in our church that will say, I'm not only showing up, we are moving to the front lines. You have people like that? Oh, you'll shake a kingdom because you choose to do that. I'm convinced this is the principle of why 
Teenagers will just date the next person. Doesn't matter if they love God, doesn't matter if they have any morals in their life, they just date because they want to be secure and relationships make them secure. I'm convinced that's why most people will, will marry just the next person. They might not even be in love with them. It's just the security of that rather than trusting God. It's a reason that some of you are, who are in business here, you would never ever chase your dreams because you are so afraid of, of failing that you never would chase your dreams. It's why some of you here today are, are staying where you are spiritually, the same place, you're the same place now as you were five and 10 years ago because we don't want to move to the front lines. And see, if all we do is live in safety, there's really not a reason for God in your life. Because see, the thing that terrifies us is moving from the middle of the room to the front lines. That's what terrifies us. It's that space that we're not really sure what God is going to do. I can still remember that when I was, we were in West Wilson Middle School and we were looking to build this building. And I had all these people around me. We put a team together and as I put this team together, I can still remember people, I can remember Ashley Hinesley, Ashley and her husband Reed and, and Ashley looking at me and said, Pastor, I think the first thing that we've got to understand is that people have to tithe because if you don't tithe, it no matter what building you got, you can't do ministry. People have to tithe. And let me tell you, now is the time. We can't wait any longer. And Shorty Hunt spoke up and said, I promise you, if we'll build it, God will bring them. We gotta build it. We can't wait any longer. And Matt Moses spoke up. Now, if you don't know Matt, that's a miracle of God within itself because Matt never talks. And Matt looked and just said, it's time. Let's quit wavering, let's go. And what's really the most amazing thing about it was Mike Faust even had a theological truth. He's, he, that dude doesn't have theological truths. And Mike spoke up and said, pastor, Let's go, let's go. And Jim Johnson, who was not on our staff at this time, Jim looked at me and said, Phil, what's your greatest fear? I said, my greatest fear is two, I have two fears. Will our people pay for it? And will people come? Everybody around the table had great faith except the person who should have had faith, the leader of the organization. I'm gonna tell you, my faith was astounding in the room. Can I tell you? I was like, oh my gosh, can we even do this? And I got people going, hey, 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 let's go, let's go, let's move. You see, because what happens is that I've got to make a choice. Am I going to? Am I going to dance with faith or if I'm, am I going to dance with fear? Friday, I celebrated my 58th birthday and my wife and I, we splurged and went out, went to Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Oh man, they'll serve that stuff in heaven, I'm telling you. And so since my heart attack, I eat very little red meat. I made up for lost time on this night. I ordered the 21 ounce cowboy ribeye. I know you're sitting there going, I can't believe you hadn't had a heart attack. And my server came, he said, do you need a box? Oh no, I, I, I don't need a box. I'm gonna eat every bite of it. I promise you, I don't need any box. After it was over with, she and I went to T-Pac it's all Broadway musical. Not, not, relax. I know some of you men right now are going, dude, check in your man card at this point, all right? If you're going to a Broadway musical, check in your man card. I not only went to a Broadway musical, I took my Kavu bag in with me <laughs> when I went to the Broadway musical. And I got in there and we saw a play, An American in Paris. It's about a guy who served in the war, served in World War II, and he was stationed in Paris. And as soon as he got in Paris, he saw a girl. He chased after her. He sang about her. He wrote about her. He drew pictures about her. All he wanted to do was just to be with her, and she would have no part of him. And he kept saying, just meet me here. Just meet me here. Just meet me here at this time every day. No, I don't want to. I'm not going to. And everything changed and they danced together. 
But then there was another problem. Another lady shows up. And she wants the American soldier. And while the person he was pursuing, he dances with, he starting to win her heart, he makes a U-turn. And he begins to dance with the next girl that came. And everything gets real cloudy for him. And you need to understand today that when you choose to dance with darkness, your vision will get cloudy pretty quickly. So let me ask you, is your heart right now dancing with darkness or is it dancing with light? Oh, you might try to cover it up, but I promise you, eventually your sin will be exposed. So ask yourself, am I gonna dance with darkness? And if you dance with darkness, you'll never show up and you'll never ever move to front lines, ever. But if you'll dance with light, if you'll dance with faith, you will be amazed of how God's gonna use you in becoming a great leader because you've shown up and because you've moved to the front lines. So where do I start? You start by giving your heart away. And secondly, then you continue on by guarding your heart and dancing with the light and not dancing with darkness. Well, how do you do that, Phil? You simply just say, God, I will do whatever you tell me to do. That's the fear part. Whatever it is you tell me, God, that's what I'm gonna do. So are you willing to take that chance to move to the front lines? Pray with me, would you? If you've never taken that step and never given your heart away to Jesus, you've never become a follower of Christ, can I encourage you to make that decision today? Just to give your heart away to Jesus. Don't try to figure it out. Just trust him with it. So if that's where you are right now and you've never made that decision and you would say, I need to become a follower of Christ. I need to give my heart away to Jesus. If you wanna make that decision right where you're seated right now, if you're watching online, I'm gonna ask that you do the same thing. But right now where you're seated, if you wanna make that decision, I'm gonna pray this prayer out loud and I'm gonna ask that you would pray that prayer silently right after me. You would just repeat it after me. So if you wanna make that decision, pray this along with me. Dear God, on this day, I wanna thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. I give you my heart today. Jesus, I give you my heart. I hold nothing back. I hand it over to you. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and to save me on this day. And I will choose to follow you from this day forward. Now, no one looking around, and I'm not gonna embarrass you, but if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to do me a favor. I want you just to lift your hand and put it back down, would you? If you prayed that prayer, just lift your hand, would you? God bless you. Anybody else? Now, for the rest of you, if you know Christ, you've got a choice to make. Who are you going to dance with?